getting a lot of time, so just stay here. Anyway, I've got a few announcements real quick. Um, then we'll get back into the service. Um, don't forget we're going to for the Annie Armstrong at the end of the month. Then um, belts are on the back table. There's also some dishes that are still here in the back. They are about two months. They need to go where they're going. To the first one. So, yeah, thank you, Lover. Thank you for your donation. We appreciate it. All right. Uh, Wednesday night, we'll have a business meeting. So, forget that business meeting Wednesday night. Any more announcements? Announcements. Any more announcements? All right. Our prayer list. Uh, I've got uh, Will Maddox. Uh, he's doing pretty good. Keep on your prayers in the car. She's doing good. Keep her in your prayers. Uh, keep Miss Joseph in your prayers. Uh, keep Mom in your prayers. Just a phrase for I don't know where I guess we had a uh, storm in Crossville, a thunderstorm, actually out of the blue, no warning dog was going to hit and hit a school. Uh, so that's a field elementary there in Crossville, which is a mile behind where I work. So I've been on seeing the video of the thunder battle. That's on top of my plant. So we had very young employer people there.
for this year. It's going to last the best of one of these.
I'm going to challenge you when you leave here today to go home and take time to actually sit there and reread this passage of Scripture and actually let God guide you on some things in this passage of Scripture. I'm telling you, folks, when you read this passage of Scripture in just a moment, you're going to understand what I mean when I say the impact of this verse is life-changing. Well, that being said, I'm going to ask you to stand as we look at Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to begin reading with verse 24. The Bible says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall soon lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Brother John, would you lead us in prayer this morning? Dear Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the sweet spirit of the Lord in hell. And Lord, I ask and I pray that we would turn it off now and the Lord big things and give us a little bit more. Be the man of God as he delivers the message that you would have to deliver. Lord. Father, we depend on you to deliver us something and that you give us a will destiny. So please do that, Lord. Uh, we thank you so much for your sweet and precious word. And I ask and pray, Lord, that as we receive this message, that we would just throw it in the back of our mind. That we would write it upon our hearts, Lord, and that we would be doers of the work. We thank you so much for all that you do. In the first name of your son, Jesus Christ. And amen, and you may be seated. The Bible tells us in that first verse that we read, if any man will follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And when we read that, we read that from this generation during this century when we look back on the cross and we recognize the cross as being a burden and being something that was difficult, being something that was challenging. And so for us, when we put that idea of the cross in the midst, we put it in the context of it being past tense. And here's what I mean by that. I now look at, if I'm going to serve God, I've got to be willing to, to suffer for Him. That means that if I have the doctor give me bad news, that's my cross to bear. I'll bear that cross. I'll continue to serve him. I'll continue to witness for him. And I'll continue to trust in him. But that's my cross to bear. Or maybe there's someone who has wronged me. Maybe I've lost a job. Maybe I have financial problems. Maybe I have uh, mental difficulties with depression and other things. And so I put all my burdens in this concept of take up my cross and follow him. But to the first century church that was reading this, and in particular to the people that Jesus was speaking to, I want to take you back to what Jesus was telling them, and I want you to have an understanding of what they would have been thinking at this time. For starters, I want you to realize that this whole conversation takes place because Jesus begins preparing his disciples that the time is coming, and in fact it's very, very near, that he's going to have to lay down his life, for three days be put in the tomb and then arise again on the third day, but that he was going to literally have to suffer and die. And that's what they heard. In fact, if you continue to read in this chapter, if you go back a few verses, you will literally hear Peter begin to rebuke the Lord and say, absolutely, this won't be done. Peter, in fact, is so adamant about it that Literally, he is willing to go to war with anybody and everybody to make sure that Jesus does not die. That's what Jesus says, and he rebukes Peter, and he looks at Peter, and he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because the ideology and the, and the message that Peter had in his mind was wrong. I'm going to challenge you today that sometimes this ideology of carrying our burdens and suffering for Christ, that that ideology is wrong. And here's what I mean by that. It's not that we don't suffer. It's not that the Bible doesn't tell us that we're going to be persecuted and suffer. That is not what this passage of Scripture is talking about. What this passage of Scripture is talking about is this, that every single person in this room, 
that calls upon Jesus as their Savior, when the Bible tells us that we're to take up our cross and follow Him, we need to have that first century mentality that says, if I must die to follow Christ, I will die. You see, Jesus hasn't gone to Calvary yet. The disciples haven't seen the resurrection yet. This story is being told and Jesus is telling his disciples this story. Jesus is telling those who have gathered around this story to, to share with them that if you're going to be a follower of mine, you must be willing to self-deny yourself. You must be willing to say, okay, all the things that I have, that I desire, that I crave, I now am willing to put on the cross. I'm willing to crucify those things, and I'm willing to accept the will of God in my life. And even if it means giving up all that happiness and joy, I'm willing to do so because I'm going to follow after Christ. Can you imagine that during our revival services and during our conferences and all of that, that during the invitation, the preacher was to get up and say, okay, all of you that want to believe in Jesus and follow after Jesus, I want you to come down here. I want you to surrender your friends, your family, your loved ones, your job, and your money. I want you to surrender everything laying right here. And then I want you to be willing to literally go out this door and if necessary, literally give your life. If somebody challenges you, they're on the street. And you literally say, I believe in Jesus and they will kill you. You say, what? That's the passage of Scripture that we just read. You see, we live in a different world, and we live in a different time. No one's knocking on our door here at this church telling us that we can't meet. No one's knocking on this door and telling us that if you profess Christ as your Savior, you're going to be put to death. No one in this country, in fact, is even saying that if you believe in Jesus, then we're going to take you out, and we're going to stone you, or we're going to kill you. Yet that is exactly what was taking place during the time of Christ. You see, following Jesus now is easy, right? Following Jesus in this day and age is easy. We get up in the morning and we give our prayers and we go off to work and we come home. We go to bed. We come to church. We do all these things. We, we are comfortable in the Spirit. We are comfortable in the church. We're comfortable in believing Christ. Because we've not been challenged to literally surrender our life for our belief. And yet Jesus is saying that's exactly the kind of service that you and I must be willing to get involved in and be involved in to serve him. You say, well, Tim, why would we do that? You know, we live in a great world, we live in a great time, and, and that's not the message that we should be sharing. We should be sharing about Jesus and his love and his caring and it's forgiving and all these things. And here's where I want to go with this. We have been studying in the book of Revelation for the past several weeks. And folks, I'm telling you, the Bible tells us there is a time coming where you're going to have to make the choice and the decision. If you ask Jesus Christ in your life during the time of tribulation, you're going to have to be willing to die for that decision. That's a real decision, right? You say, well, Gil, how does that affect me? What does that mean for me? How do I, I, why would I care? That's here in the tribulation. Here's the challenge I want you to grab hold of. This morning, before you leave here, you're going to have to examine your heart and your life. You're going to have to ask yourself this very important question. Have I truly asked Jesus Christ, not only to forgive me of my sins and save me, but to be Lord of my life, have I truly had a salvation experience? See, here's what's crazy, folks. I sat there, and as we studied the book of Revelations, and as we looked at all this, uh, uh, the different things that may come out and may happen in the future, and, and certainly we don't know all the details of these things. God has given us some wisdom to it, and we have some understanding to it, but we don't know it all, and so as we read it, we have some confusion. But here's one thing that is absolutely rock solid. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are not going to be raptured out of the tribulation. That we know. And so when we come to this time of tribulation, there may be people in this audience this morning that though they come to church every Sunday, and though they may say they are a Christian, they may be truly left behind sitting in this pew if Jesus were to come even at this moment. Because they did not ask Jesus Christ in their life, 
They had not surrendered their life to him, and they had not made him Lord of their life. Sometimes we as preachers and teachers and Sunday school leaders and other folks, we do a disservice to our church by trying to make it so easy that we forget to tell people it's also very serious. And you say, well, Tim, how would we get people to accept Christ if we're telling them that they're going to suffer, if we tell them that they may even have to die for the cause of Christ? How are we ever going to get people to accept Jesus in their heart? And it's found in the verse, I want you to look over in verse 27. I want you to see this. The Bible says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Do you know what we have a hard time with? Delaying satisfaction or delaying the idea of our reward. We have a hard time with that. Patience is not an easy thing in America today. Uh, I, I, I find that it is frustrating when, when somebody says, you just need to be patient. That is frustrating. Don't you ever have a problem? It's frustrating when somebody says you got to be patient. It's frustrating when you have to wait in line. I don't know about you, but if you have ever gone to Disney World and you have ever had to stand in line, by the time you're done, you're asking yourself, did I really pay somebody money to stand in four hours in line? That's what you're asking yourself. Pay all the money to go to a park, get to ride three rides the entire day, and the rest of the time you're standing in a line. It makes me literally want to go out here and say, give me 50 bucks, and you can stand in my line. Now, I mean, think about that. That's what we do. But while you're standing in that line, the impatience that you have, let one person cut in front of you. How do you feel? You lose your mind, don't you? Hey, line's back here, bro. Hey, well, I just went down. I don't care what you got. I don't care. Hey, the line's back here, right? You lose your mind over that, right? That idea of being impatient. We experienced it as kids, too, don't we? When, when we were kids and Christmas time came around and Mom and Dad would wrap presents, I, we were literally not allowed anywhere near the Christmas tree because everybody wanted to grab the present, shake the present, open the present, do all those things. And, of course, we weren't allowed to open presents till Christmas Day. I don't know what was worse, Johnny, when they wrapped it and put it under the tree or Christmas Eve at about 11.50 and you're still being told you can't open it and then it hits 12 o'clock. It's official. It's Christmas Day. Kids understand this. But you still ain't allowed to open your present because it's not Christmas morning. Right? Drives kids crazy. Right? Why? Because of that impatience. And yet what Jesus is telling us is this. If you want to find the true reward in your life, be patient. Continue to live a life of servitude. Continue to be willing to self-denial and, and literally to forget about the dreams and hopes and all those other things of this world. Put your dreams and your hopes and your visions on the things of the world to come. Put your faith and trust in God that He's going to reward you for your goodness and your works. Trust in Him that what He's telling you is true. So He rebukes Peter by saying, Get behind me, Satan, because Peter has got the wrong idea. He's expecting Jesus to live, and he's expecting Jesus to take the throne. He's expecting Jesus as the Messiah to begin to rule. He's expecting the Roman emperor to literally lay down his crown at the feet of Jesus and allow Jesus to take the throne. And Jesus is saying, this is not the place for me to take rule. This is just temporary. And by the way, this is not the place for you to set your mind and your visions on that you will rule. Rather, your day is coming, and it's going to be a place called heaven, not a place here on earth. And so this morning, as we gather here, one of the challenges that we have is this. Am I willing to take up my cross and follow the Lord? Am I willing, literally, if somebody knocks on my door and tells me that if I deny Christ, then I can live, but if I don't deny Christ, I will die. Am I willing to put my life on the line and give Him glory in the things that God has to do? Am I willing to surrender everything I have to truly call Him Lord in my life? As I ask that question this morning to you, are you willing to lay down your life literally for the cause of Christ? You say, Tim, 
how would Jesus ever expect me to do that in a place called America where we can do these things and worship him so freely? I'm going to ask you this. Which is more important to you? Making sure that your friends are saved, your loved ones are saved, or making sure you make it to work on time and work? Well, that hit home, didn't it? Which is more important to you? Making sure that you leave here this morning on the right time to get to the right place at the right time to accomplish the right task that you have for the day, or letting God be God and letting God have glory during this service? Which one's more important to you this morning? Going and having a great retirement or making sure that people inherit the kingdom of God? You see, those are the real questions that Jesus asked his disciples that day. Those are the real challenges that he put before them in saying, there's going to come a time that if you're going to follow me, let me tell you where you're going. You're going straight to a cross of denial. You're going to have to surrender all that you have to me. <laughs> Jesus also phrases it in a different way. He says this, what does it profit you to gain everything in this world but lose your soul? What does it profit you to gain everything that's here on this planet, all the happiness and all the uh, uh, different resources and all the different monies, and all the, what does it profit you to gain all those things at the expense of your soul? Folks, this morning, I want to put that challenge to you today. What is it that's in your life that's worth holding on to and keeping and locking down in your life rather than submitting to God? What is it that you're willing to trade your soul for? What is it that you're willing to trade your joy for? What is it that you're willing to trade God's lordship in your life for? This morning, as we come to our time of invitation, the question is this, am I willing this morning to take whatever that thing is, am I willing to leave it here at the, here at the altar here this morning and allow Jesus Christ to take it away from me so that I might give him glory in my life. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed and with your eyes closed. And as Brother David comes with heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I want you to ask yourself two questions. If you don't mind, give me just a few moments. I want you to ask yourself just two questions. First one is this. Can I honestly within my own heart say that there is a time in my life where I ask for forgiveness of sin and I ask Jesus to save me? Did I truly give my whole heart to him? number one. The number two is this. Am I still holding on to something in my life that hinders me from doing the work of the Lord? Have I held on to something and holding on to it more dear than the fact that Jesus has secured my soul a place in heaven? Whatever God leads you to do this morning, my heart's desire is that we might all be obedient, that we might all willingly and truly open our hearts up. And, you know, Father, I pray that you might just take your uh, place in this service this morning, taking a hold of each heart, as if God just refreshing us and reminding us of the things that we need to do. God, I pray that you might place the conviction in each person's mind and each person's heart to make the choices that you have them to make. And God, most importantly, we ask this morning that you might find us uh, praising you and worshiping you in accordance with your will. God, we submit ourselves to you and we trust you. For it's in your holy and precious name we pray. With heads bowed and with eyes closed, as Brother David sings, would you come?
Judas, 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 Judas,